Okay, and, and before I talk to about uh, today, can you please uh, remember yourself to, I mean, turn off your phones or if you want to tweet, put it on silent because this is uh, all uh, on, the, on the record. So to today's talk, full house. I don't know if we have many aspiring money launderers in the, in the room or apparently there's lots of bankers, which I find a bit worrying. They need to fine tune their skills, but anyway. We have the real, um, the real um, money, former money launderer here in um, the person of uh, Bruce Aitken. Actually, when he joined the club in 1984, was it? 84. Yeah, 84. He, that, was his, um, that was his job. So I wonder what the membership committee was uh, <laughs> checking, maybe. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. So Mr. Aitken uh, worked for the American Express International Banking Corporation in Vietnam from 69 to 71, and then for Deek and Company Far East in Hong Kong until 1980. And that company was part of the worldwide Deek organization, which was founded by Nicholas Deek, one of the founders of the Office of Strategic Services, which is a forerunner of the CIA. Bruce Aitken then set up his own company, which he's going to talk about, First Financial Services, which was in operation from 1980 to 1990. So this got him in pretty uh, amazing uh, or scary adventures and situations that he just told us a little bit about. And then later uh, in life, after a stay uh, in jail of uh, 10 months, he completely uh, changed his take on life and he kind of went full circle. He now spends uh, a lot of time helping prisoners, helpers, and um, he's all kind of looking at the other end of the society. He has a radio show uh, on Metro 104 uh, once a week uh, with a very loyal following, which is called The, the Hour of Love on Sunday night, 8 to 11 uh, p.m. And of course, he just authored a book based on the apparently 17 boxes that he received when finally he was uh, out, of, uh, out of trouble and, and he knew there was so much information there that one day he should write a book. Well, that day has come and it's called The Cleaner, the true story of one of the world's most successful money launderers. And of course, uh, Bruce will stay around after uh, the talk to sign uh, his, uh, his book uh, if you, if you want to buy them. Please welcome Bruce Atkin. Thank you very much, Florence, and uh, to the board and to the FCC. I'm very honored to be here today. And, uh, to all the members here too, thank you very much for coming and, and for your interest. I know that uh, money laundering is a topic that's very much in the forefront of the world news uh, these days. And uh, so I started with a brazen title actually, and I hope it would bring people to, to listen to the talk as well. Uh, the money laundering, catch me if you can. But uh, it's, uh, it's a title I think that really relates back to uh, the times of the 1960s, 70s, and 80s when I was very active uh, in, in this business because then, actually, there wasn't such a thing as money laundering. It was called uh, circumventing foreign exchange regulations. <laughs> so and then, then in Asia, every country around this area had foreign uh, exchange regulations that uh, many, many people were looking forward to circumvent. And uh, so actually, I had a lot of competition. Our competition was finance companies, banks, lawyers, accountants, and even the church. Uh, many people were involved in uh, circumventing foreign exchange uh, regulations, and uh, except, uh, of course, the governments uh, frowned upon it, but the penalties and the circumstances, it was much more lighthearted in, in those days. And hence my, my title, uh, Catch Me With You Can, uh, If You Can. Uh, it turned out to be a vocation that uh, I never planned at all. Uh, it was either karma or fate that led me to it. I admire people who are born with some type of a native talent, if they're an artist or a musician, and they, their vocation is very clear in front of them in their lives. I wasn't so fortunate. I actually started out, my, my vocation or my ability was actually, and my desire and dream was to become a professional baseball player, and I was well on that way until I had 
Uh, fate intervened, and I had a <clears throat> major knee injury, and uh, I had to do something else. So besides protesting the Vietnam War, listening to Bob Dylan in Greenwich Village, uh, I, I got a job offer with American Express International Banking Corporation in Vietnam. So I said, well, this is my chance to see what's really going on there. And uh, so I took it, and, and I, need, you know, I needed the, the funds. I was just out of school. So I began in Vietnam in 1969, and, and uh, this is what uh, introduced me to the so-called free market, or as we say, black market, because what was going on in Vietnam was quite interesting. There were three currencies there. Uh, the U.S. dollar, green, we call it, say, for example, $100 bill. And I'll also have to watch the time. I have an awful lot of information. I'll speed it up because it's only about 20 minutes. So uh, I'd like to explain a couple of methods and a couple of scandals and put those together. I think that would, would be the best approach. But with three currencies floating around in Vietnam, <clears throat> U.S. dollar green, MP3, MPC, military payment certificates, and Vietnamese piasta. We'll skip the piasta now. As a bank manager, I could take one M 100 MPC, it looks like monopoly money, and I could bring it into my bank and exchange it for 100 green, okay? One to one. I could take the 100 green back to see, to see Mr. Tai, my favorite Chinese money changer at the top of the Astor Hotel in Saigon. I could take that uh, 100 uh, green and he would give me 200 MPC, a double my money. I could go back to my bank and take my 200 MPC and turn it into 200 in green. Make another trip to see Mr. Tai and turned my 200 green into 400 MPC. I hope you caught on so far. But I know you'll understand because I felt just like the Fed, creating money out of thin air. <laughs> and uh, I guess I was hooked. So I lived in Vietnam for a couple of years doing this. I, I never really uh, made a fortune. I, I lived well on the economy uh, in Vietnam, Piasta. And uh, we were told that not to touch it because the money would go to the Viet Cong. Well, I found out after uh, being there and knowing a lot of people that the money went to Hong Kong businessmen, to traders, and uh, any, any type of currency exchange controls that exist, they normally prohibit, uh, say for example, the Philippines. Uh, the Philippines is a very delightful country where we had uh, good facilities, <clears throat> and, uh, uh, but a lot of Filipinos then wanted to buy stocks in New York or whatever. They had a hard time if they went through the central bank. So this type of money laundering actually was very uh, lightweight. It was for good uh, purposes. And the Philippines, uh, uh, God bless them, the central bank in the Philippines there used to quote a daily rate, the official rate on Philippine pesos, and right under it, black market rate, Deakin Company, Far East Limited, Hong Kong. <laughs> so that's another uh, indication that I thought I was not in such a, such a difficult business. Anyway, after th three, uh, <clears throat> three years uh, uh, there, I moved on to Hong Kong, and by fate or karma, I happened to join Deakin Company, Far East Limited. And uh, Deakin Company, Forest Limited, I was hired in New York by Mr. Deak himself, and Mr. Nicholas Deak, who became a very good friend of mine. He also, when, I, when he hired me, I was just mentioning the salary was not so high in New York, so he also hired my wife, who's a Hong Kong girl, and she was a secretary. So he hired us both at that time and became a good friend, actually. But uh, Mr. Deak was a very charismatic man, Hungarian. He, took the, uh, he became a major in the U.S. Army. He became a polygot, great language abilities. And... Uh, <clears throat> He took the Japanese flag of surrender in Burma after World War II. He was a fierce advocate of privacy, little government, and, and with his language abilities, he joined actually the OSS, the Intelligence Services, which was founded by Wild Bill Donovan, which became the forerunner of the uh, CIA. <clears throat> well, needless to say, I found myself working then for the Rolls-Royce and the Cadillac of the money laundering business all rolled into one. Our motto was, have cash, no questions asked. Uh, it was really motto, have cash, call Deek. And that was it. And we did have no questions asked. No questions asked if you were wealthy, if you were a tax dodger, CIA, drug dealers, just plain old misfits and ordinary folks. Come in, and that was our, our, our KYC, no questions asked. You know, that is know your client now, which is so apparent today. <clears throat> However, we did have another method to know our client, and it was called the $2 bill rule. For example, if we had a client from, come from Taiwan, he said, I have NT dollars I want you to buy in exchange for U.S. dollars, fine, we'd cut a U.S. $2 bill in half and give him the half. Now, we'd never do business unless the other half of the $2 bill was matched. And on a pickup, we call it, we'd travel around to pick up the currency. And that was our KYC, the $2 bill. <clears throat> so 
And then Mr. Deke, um, excuse me, there's another very charismatic fellow who hired me in Hong Kong. His name was Dirk Brink, a very, very interesting uh, sort of a genius in, in, in finding ways to move money. Uh, Dirk Brink was born in Indonesia. Uh, he uh, grew up in South Africa, which is telling, which I have something to say next. Uh, and uh, he actually was a prisoner of war and during the Japanese uh, um, occupation of Thailand and worked on the River Kwai. Very interesting, charismatic person as well. He and Mr. Deke were quite a combination. And uh, what they did, <clears throat> though, they had uh, their theory was uh, that we should move money around any way we could find. Now, we normally had a way to do it with swaps. We could buy and sell currency in the subcontinent. It's called Hundi. Buy and sell current, uh, money on a, on a phone call, do the swaps. But this was often down, and we had to find other ways. And the Dirk Brink found out a very ingenious way to smuggle money, which we used to do all the time, in very specially made, beautiful golf bags. So we had golf bags flying all around the world, probably to 30 countries. My favorite one, which I called Old Faithful, had been all over the world many, many times. But the first time I was asked to do it, I had temporarily been working on Deacon, Deacon Company Guam when Dirk called, come to Hong Kong right away. We need somebody, a warm body, to bring yen to Tokyo once a month. About a half million dollars of yen packed into a specially made golf bag. So I can do that. I didn't play golf, but anyway, that was first. But, I, I, but it was against, against my nature somehow. I said, what kind of a business is this? What kind of a company am I working for? But I needed the job like everybody else. I, I'll give it a try. Then Dirk said to me one day, he said, you look worried. And I said, yes, I am worried. And he said, don't worry. Smuggling is a white man's privilege. <laughs> and, and I apologize to any Indian members that we have in this, ladies in here right now. But he also, he said, if you're in trouble, always get behind an Indian. I said, what, what, what on earth for? He said, because they're always smuggling something. <laughs> and you, with $500,000 wrapped around the five iron, you'll get right past by. And so I said, well, this is a very unusual company. I apologize, of course. For the, if I, don't, I don't mean to offend anyone, but this is the way the world was in those days. It was about 30, 40 years ago. Times have changed. But anyway... <clears throat> Uh, what happened, though, there was uh, I was bringing the GN to Japan, and uh, I met our agent there, who happened to be uh, the order. Uh, the, these orders came from Lockheed Corporation through the U.S. consulate here. So I said, "That's pretty good people to to do this for." Our agent in Japan was Father Jose Galliano, a Spanish priest. So this is really good karma. I would fly there once a month, give the money to Father Jose. We had a nice lunch at the La Plata's restaurant in Tokyo, and off he would go. He'd give the money to somebody else, to somebody else, to somebody else. Finally, one day it blew up because the end somebody else was the Prime Minister Tanaka. So it blew up into be the Lockheed scandal. So not knowing your client sometimes can backfire in a big, in a, in a gigantic fashion. So we had then Japanese were crawling all over our office. It led to the Foreign Corrupt Corp Practices Act. The church committee, Frank Church in the Amer in American Congress, made it illegal to, to um, bribe foreign officials. Mr. Deke was called before Congress. He refused to cooperate. He said, we are not policemen and we will not do the policemen's work. Actually, this was one reason why he started a fallout with his mentors also, were in, which I call the dark government, the CIA people. <clears throat> Another tangent there, uh, but it's important later. Uh, I was Deacon Gu Deke Guam when Saigon fell in 1975. I happen to be familiar, of course, with Go Kim Tan Gold Tales. And uh, all of a sudden, the uh, Anderson Air Force Base in Guam, the, uh, uh, the uh, metal detectors were going wild. All the Vietnamese were coming there with gold tails. You know, these very malleable ones, you can bend them around you. Uh, setting off the thing all the time. So Deke started then what we call a gold train. We started buying all the gold. We were the only people that could do it. And we did this one on for about a month. We had a couriers coming with Hong Kong with cash, backpacks, gold coming back to Hong Kong every day on the flights, which were in the middle of the night because Guam is in the middle of the ocean and it's where America's day begins in the middle of nowhere. So this was going on for, for a month. And uh, <clears throat> also, uh, but the State Department then, we had to make a decision. I decided to buy the gold at X dollars per ounce, with the gold ounce price. Of course, it was each one was a tail, so we had about a 20% margin. And the government actually, later on, when they, they asked if we could improve on it, we did finally. But we were there at the right time. Another method that was interesting, and I'll, I'll try to speed up my, my talk, but in Australia, it was a big, big business for us, too. In Australia, we, I would go to Melbourne, for example. You had some things that you do, you do against your nature, against your will. Our agents, Abby and Charlie, two Russian immigrants in Melbourne, 
would give me about $500,000 in uh, Australian dollars in, uh, each trip. Uh, now, what happened, though, I'd have to bring the, uh, the money to our uh, laundering facility, which happened to be the ANZ Bank in the corner of Pitt and Hunter in Sydney. I was in Melbourne, though, and I had this money. It was usually, then they had $50 Australian. Each pack would be 5,000, so 100 packs. I would take the train overnight back to Sydney, and I had to convert all that money overnight to Hong Kong style in square blocks, if you know what it is. Wrap it in clear plastic, those red seals on all the corners, declared Deakin Company Far East Limited Hong Kong repatriated Australian dollars, because our office collected Australian dollars from all over the world. Of course, it didn't come from Melbourne. It, came, it, it didn't come from Hong Kong, it came from Melbourne. But I have, to, I have to sweat it out in front up to the bank, see the cashier, the head cashier, Richard Jenkins, and all my handiwork overnight was in 20 minutes turned back to Aussie style. And we would uh, receive the money uh, in telegraphic transfer to San Francisco Charter Bank of London, San Francisco, to our account. So this was going on for years and years and years, probably to the tune, oh, I would say probably $50 million over the years while I was with Deke. We had people going there once or twice a month and uh, uh, also uh, uh, doing the same thing. So it was quite a, a big business, and we um, definitely were very popular for the few Australian clients that we have. Now, I started my own company called First Financial Services in 1980 because I was traveling so much around with Deke. I, I practically didn't know where I was uh, most of the time. And uh, there had been another scandal because uh, Deke was sending uh, cash from Manila in Manila envelopes to their offices in Hawaii, their offices in Guam, uh, San Francisco, and Honolulu, not reporting it. This was caught on eventually by the customs, and Deke was fined, and uh, there was another sort of uh, um, nail in the coffin to his relationships with the government. Um, but uh, golf bags, I say, were continuing to go around the world. Another one that I wanted to mention, of course, was USA, because it's important. Uh, but, uh, and also in, uh, in Australia, once again, not knowing your client created a big problem with uh, We had two of our clients that I inherited, uh, Tim Milner and Ray Cessna. They turned out they were smugglers of Thai marijuana. They would ship it there on a yacht, drop it off on the coast on a vacant island, and the other fellow would pick it up in a truck. It turned into cash. We didn't ask any questions, but eventually, of course, I got to know people. I got to know what they were doing, but by then it was too late. Uh, but the, this, this blew up because they were arrested one day due, due to what the government's main tools are, uh, telephone, taps, and snitches. This is the best tools that the government have to catch people like us at that time. So what happened, uh, they were caught with 100,000 Buddha sticks, and they were put in jail. It looked like a very, very serious case. Uh, but they had a good lawyer named uh, Morgan Ryan, and uh, with the help of about $50,000, which I was able to deliver them over the time, uh, on the date of the trial, the case was miraculously switched to a magistrate's court with no recording equipment, and they got off with a slap on the wrist because the THC was said to be so weak that they couldn't really put these people in jail for 10 years. Anyway, later on, uh, Tim Milner was kidnapped in uh, 1986 in Thailand because they had a falling out with one of his partners, and this blew up again one, in, into the headlines of the Sydney Morning Herald, and it was called... How the deals were done, the six man in the Cessna Milner affair. Now you can imagine who the sixth one was. There was Milner, Morgan Ryan, Solicitor Chief Magistrate Murray Farquhar, Police Chief Merv Woods, Ray Cessna, and I became the sixth one, the mystery money mover. And it, it listed my experiences as from the three years from 1981. Sydney 15 times, Tokyo 10 times, Taipei 8, I traveled a lot. Singapore, San Francisco, Honolulu, Macau, Brunei, Jakarta, KL, Melbourne 10 times, plus many countries in Europe and Africa. That was the way I would spend most of the time on the plane in those years. But it became a big problem. The, the, the Costigan Commission, Government Commission, was there. And uh, again, we, we, we were sort of exposed uh, once again. Now, get quickly to the USA. How to move a million dollars out of the USA? Dirk Brink scratched his head for a long time until he came up for, with a very, very interesting way. There's a million dollars in $100 bills, say, for example, our client would have in San Francisco. He wanted to move it out surreptitiously. What Dirk did, we would send a million dollar package, and we ch tested it a couple of times first, of course. He would send this package by courier, or eventually by Brinks when it was open here, or by Pan Am Cargo, said to be a million dollars. It was wrapped exactly like the package in America, except 
There was $100 bills on the outside and $10,001 bills on the inside. It was never checked. It was declared as a million. Of course, the packages were, sh were switched. Uh, the $1 bills would be sent back to Hong Kong in a, in a golf bag to be, wait for the next time to do it again in all different denominations. So this is how it worked. And we did this a lot. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, Mr. Deke uh, fell out of, uh, uh, with the uh, powers that be, and much to my chagrin, he was having financial difficulties. And in 1984, a deranged lady walked into his office in New York and, and murdered him. So <clears throat> very sad. He was really a truly a great man. And who could have done it? Well, you can only guess who, who can do such things like that. Uh, anyway, I went on my merry ways dealing business with people like Howard Marks, who then became a very famous smuggler, wrote a book called Mr. Nice. Fortunately, he wrote the foreword in my book, which I'm very blessed. Uh, Tim Milner, of course. There was an American, a very brilliant American fellow, a Stanford University student named Robert Kimball. He was a client also. He got caught also smuggling from Thailand, and he was sentenced to 45 years. Can you imagine that? But when he was in the Thai prison, Bang Kwan, which I visited him a few times, he was an amazing entrepreneur. He got the prison up and working and actually had the surplus, prison uh, funds in a surplus for the first time. And much to his chagrin, five years later, he got a royal pardon. The police, they came to him and said, today, you're out. Royal pardon, go. And he said, I can't leave now. These 200 people are, 200 people are working for me. <laughs> so but my point is, you know, there's people make mistakes. Uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of... Uh, feeling about people who happen to be in prison. There's a lot of good pr people in prison. I had the experience of myself, and I met some really great people, I must say. They all make mistakes, but uh, you know, I, I, I've come to more to uh, forgive and forget, judge and not be judged, and I think you're a lot, a lot happier. But I went on my merry way doing business with Nugent Hand. I'll move ahead now quickly. Uh, Rakesh Saxena, who's a friend of mine who almost precipitated the Asian financial crisis himself single-handedly uh, by Bank of, Bank of Commerce. Um, Bangkok, he was scounded with about $85 million. He later was caught and was spent about 10 years in a, uh, in a prison, which was a rented condo in Vancouver that he paid for. And I was fortunate enough to go and see him once because I thought maybe we could do some business, but no, it was, it was too late. <laughs> and, uh, but the, 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 you know, the, micros, the government is not stupid. The microphone was, microscope was really focused on me then. Uh, I had been always going through U.S. Customs. I had a difficult time. Uh, I didn't know what to do, so I decided maybe I should close down this first financial, but keep a, a separate parallel for my best clients. Anyway, so I, I, I turned down a money laundering business in Reno, Nevada that it turned out in uh, 1987. I turned it down, and fortunately, because it was a setup by the FBI, my four top clients there were caught at that day. So the government came to me, and I said, well, uh, Bruce, uh, all these people have money with your company. We want your cooperation. Where is it? Okay, three minutes. I'm going to go really quick now. Okay, I really get to make it really uh, short. Uh, I didn't co cooperate. Why? Because the 13 money laundering counts in the indictment didn't exist in Hong Kong. There was no such things. And also, I had confidentiality agreements. So I said, I'm sorry, I couldn't do anything. So the government didn't like that. And I was traveling to Vietnam in, uh, on June 9, 1989. When I left Hong Kong, the State Department canceled my passport. So I was eventually found in Bangkok and arrested and put on a plane back to America and put in my client's cases. I was facing 20 years in Reno, Nevada, and 20 years in Seattle. In Seattle, based on one transaction where a, a, a snitch, and, and uh, F, uh, F, what do you call it, a uh, DEA snitch, deposited $500,000 to my accountant. He automatically transferred it to Bangkok. I wasn't even there, but I got uh, indicted on that too. So anyway, eventually he went to a plea bargain and... Uh, I was released after 10 months, and my clients paid most of my fine. I was pretty ruined in terms of what else I could do. Uh, there was a Seattle prosecutor who was very, very upset that I was released. He said, I only served 10 months, and I had four years unsupervised probation in Hong Kong. This is ridiculous. You know, this person should be incarcerated much, much longer. And uh, so after that, those four years, I, I basically had to hide out in Vietnam uh, because I was afraid I was going to be uh, kidnapped again. And so Tim Miller and I got together real briefly. We had something to do. We needed something to do. So we organized the first Saigon Marathon in 1992. It went to 1993 in Hanoi, back and forth. Brian Adams concert in 1994. Uh, World Championship surf surfing event at China Beach in 1995. A uh, Hong Kong to Not Trying yacht race, which is still going on now, I'm happy to see. 
Uh, but then I couldn't bring my children there. There were no schools. So I came back to Hong Kong, floundered around like a fish out of water. And then I think one day I felt there was, I always thought that I had a lot of faith in my life. And I always prayed a lot, especially when the golf wear bag was going around on the carousel. <laughs> and I said, thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. It arrived again. And by the way, my old faithful always arrived. It was never checked. So I'll make a long story short. I, I looked at my life. I said, well, who's, gonna, who's going to employ a former convicted money launderer? I'm, I'm in deep trouble. So I went to the church and, <laughs> and really prayed a little bit. And then I heard there, to serve the Lord is the highest calling. So I said, okay, I must do that. So really quickly, I had a friend of mine, Pakistani friend, who... Um, uh, was a Muslim, and he became a uh, con convert and a Baptist pastor. We opened up a kiosk at Shung Wan Gallup Point. You may remember it outside. We had finger food there, a jar. You put in the money, you take the food. We had no whatever you wanted. We had singers there, choir on weekends. And uh, it was a very popular thing. Employers were coming down and, and, and uh, help serving their domestic helpers. It was a wonderful experience. But then SARS came, so very, very quickly we were shut down. And I said, well... I'm going to play this music on the radio. So I went to Metro Plus. They said, sure, you can buy the time, do whatever you want. So I started a program called The Hour of Love in 19, uh, 2004. It's still on right now. Uh, it's uh, 8.30 to 11 every Sunday night on Metro Plus. And uh, uh, my listeners are mostly domestic helpers, estimated about 80,000. Plus, I have a captive audience. All the prisoners in Hong Kong listen to my program. Because I receive about 20, 25 letters from them every week. I get recordings from their families all over the world, play their children's recordings, and I play their music. So it's become a vocation. And in order to support it, I wrote a book. Uh, the government had taken 10 boxes away from me when, I, when they raided my office in my home in Hong Kong earlier. And uh, I insisted that I always get those 10 boxes back. Absolutely furious with my lawyer. One day, around 1994, I had a call from the U.S. Consul here. Mr. Aiken, we have your 17 boxes. 17? I said, well, maybe they're smaller boxes. Well, they weren't smaller, but they, the, the clerk, God bless him, had sent me the snitch handwritten reports, the FBI reports, the CIA re reports, my, all my documents. Everything was there, and I said, one day, God willing, I'm going to have to write a book. And uh, I've, there's a lot left out because of time. There's a lot of very funny experiences here. I'd like to say a little bit, if I have one more minute, about the future, uh, about because money laundering is a very, very important topic these days. But the conclusion I have, I remember the good old days, Hong Kong laissez-faire government. And I'm afraid that money laundering can be, a, can be a paranoia that's a little bit out of control, creating another uh, satellite industries with all the rules and regulations that are required. And when it comes to terrorism, for example, I don't think any terrorist is going to go to Hong Kong Bank and remit the money to their counterpart. I'm sure they do it through Hundi or a telephone call without going through the banking system at all. Yet all the population is subjugated now to these reporting requirements and whatever. I never thought reporting requirements would come to America. I thought privacy was much more important. But it's a big tool of the government, and I can't deny that, that it works in a lot of cases. But I think we have to be very, very careful that it doesn't become a paranoia. In Hong Kong, uh, the number of reports has quadrupled in six years. There's a deluge of tens of thousands of suspicious financial transactions. And that went up from uh, 20,000 in 2011 to 92,000 last year. So it sort of mirrors in America, after 9-11, you know, you have the, uh, the security situation now in, in America. How many millions and millions of hours are wasted with people queuing up on airport going through this amazing security at every airport in America these days? I mean, there's got to be a very economic cost. So I only say to Hong Kong, there's going to be an economic cost here, too. You can hardly open an account with Hong Kong Bank these days without, you know, be making you feel like a criminal. And uh, I, I don't think the population really wants that. I, I call it a little bit of paranoia. I may be, uh, you know, criticized for it because of my past. I, I don't think money laundering was a big deal. Some people ask me if I would do it again, and I would say I lived a very wonderful, exciting life. I didn't become a baseball player, but I loved it, and I would do it in a heartbeat. So I really, really appreciate very much you taking the time coming here today to listen to my tale. I must say there is much more in the book. And uh, if I can mention the price, the book is sold here also at the, at the FCC if you can't buy one today. But it's only $200, and it all goes to support my radio program. Um, it's five for $1,000, the same thing. So I, <laughs> I really, really appreciate it, and I wish you all luck. And I love this club, and I really appreciate you taking the time of your busy days to coming to hear my speech and hopefully to read my book. And God bless us all. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Fantastic uh, talk. Thank you very much, uh, Bruce. The only reason I was uh, showing you the time is so that we have a few minutes for q and sure. but it was fascinating, and I, I wish Thank I didn't you. have to interrupt you. Thank so you. we'll take questions now, because we're short on time. Please keep your questions as concise as possible. Um, yeah, so sure, Enda, we'll, we'll start. I'll kick off. Bruce, just mm -hmm. listening to you, one thought occurred to me that the plumbing of the financial system and banking in general has, has changed completely. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, if even 10 years ago. Do you right. think you could do what you were doing over those decades? Do you think you could do that these days? No, I don't think so. For example, when I had a client come in with a suitcase full of money, like Howard Marks, first time I met him, we was very well referred. We met over a weekend. He gave me a big suitcase and put it in your pantry. And it turned out there was a million, million dollars in it when I went to my office that Monday. And I called Rex Young at Hang Sing Bank, and I said, I have a big deposit to make. Rex Young said, okay, well, the coffee will be on, the red carpet is rolled out. Now they call the police, so there's a, there's, <laughs> there's, there's a big difference. But Howard, you know, basically, these people that he did his smuggling, it wasn't, I think it's in a way, it was for the excitement and the energy. It wasn't really so much for the money, because we went out for a, a, a drink that night, we had a glass of wine, and he said, oh, by the way, when you open the, uh, the, the there's instructions in the suitcase when you open it, but here's the combination. And on a napkin, he wrote it, 333. Three, three. So I said, oh, I can figure that out. I opened it up that next morning and says, here's $150,000 goes to my account. The other eight hundred and fifty sent to Malik in Pakistan over a period of time. So, uh, no, I couldn't do this business anymore, I think, because of the uh, awareness uh, of uh, money laundering in, in this day, in day and age. Yeah. Question there. Thank you. Introduce yourself. As uh, Peter Mock, uh, associate Hi, Peter. member. Just one simple question. You mentioned mm -hmm. about South Africa. Yes. Right. Please follow up. Uh, South Africa, well, <laughs> Dirk Brink was a, a South African, spoke Africans, and uh, was uh, really my contact there. He lived in a farm called in Whit River, White River, and um, he traveled back and forth and to every other month uh, there. And uh, when he was away, I suddenly, as a young man, became his manager in this big office dealing with this beehive of activity, a deke. Uh, the office is, uh, was right, you could look up Pettus Street and see it. Deacon Company Far East used to be fourth floor shell house. And uh, it was known as a cash only operating business and flourished, everybody would go there. South Africa had strange, very strict exchange controls there too, but South African ran. We were very, very, very cautious, but we also had facilities to buy them there. And we also supplied Krugerrands to Hong Kong and uh, most of the uh, banks that we were dealing with. Uh, so I didn't have uh, much experience there myself, except I was in Whit River one day working for, waiting for Dirk Brink. I think sometimes when things were happening in the office and he, he wanted people out of the way, he sent them off on a trip to nowhere. And I was there at his farm, very interesting farm, because it had, I could hear the telex pattering in the tree upstairs. And he had a, 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 like a, a ladder would go around this tree, and his office was upstairs there. And that would wake me up in the middle of the night. So I went up there one time, almost fell over, and it said, Bruce, come back to Hong Kong. And so it was the nature of the, of the game uh, that uh, uh, you, you, know, you never knew what was going to happen from one day to the next. Next question. Thank you. John Resnick, speaking Hi, John. of South Africa, last week there was a kidnapping, and the kidnappers demanded the ransom in Bitcoin. Ooh, How do you uh -huh. view money laundering in the new world of cryptocurrency? Uh, that, that's a good question. I, I, I'm not a real uh, uh, expert by any stretch of the imagine on Bitcoin. I know how these blockchain things are sort of working. Uh, this is, a, a th an area I think that's very dangerous, I would think. And uh, to be used like that, that's terrible. Now, this is where government should be focusing their effort, how to stop that. I really wouldn't have any idea, though, though myself. Yeah, it's much more complicated for me. <laughs> Thank you. Before Thank the you. era of Bitcoin, actually, I was going to ask you about smuggling with diamonds or gold. Oh, that would have been easy, I think. <laughs> Old faithful full of diamonds. Well, I might have had to take off myself. <laughs> so you, were, you, you didn't have to... No, we that, never... Only cash. Only cash, yes. Our motto is buy, uh, de uh, buy cash, and uh, that was it. No questions asked. And, well, no questions asked is great for 99% of all of our clients. You know, it was a big risk uh, for the ones that uh, got into trouble, and, and we got brought into the trouble too. Y yes, Will. Uh, Will Charles. Right. Um, do you really think it was the right play?
Do you really think it was uh, a deranged lady who shot Mr. D? Not at all. Not at all. I, um, hard to say because uh, it's alleged that it was really the, uh, the, the dark government, who that would be. I would say, who's capable of doing such things? I would only say CIA type of uh, people. I'm not sure if it's America or other. Might have been South American clients who lost funds too. But the lady was brainwashed. She was from Seattle and she w went to Florida. And some people met her there and got a gun. And she walked into Mr. Deke's office and said, they told me to do it, and, and shot him. They said, who? And she rolled up in a fetal position and basically has been in a mental hospital ever since. So uh, I don't think, uh, I think it was very surreptitious. Mr. Deke had fallen out of favor because of the Manila non-reporting, the, the gold-buying tales in, in Guam, and uh, also uh, the Lockheed situation. It seemed, and, uh, and I'm sure that he had many, many, many more, more secrets uh, that uh, needed to be kept secret. So I'd say it's alleged. I, I couldn't uh, you know, point the figure at anybody more than that. Thank you. Next question, Martin. Uh, Simon Riquet. Hi. Uh, hi. You haven't really talked about how you made money or Deke made money. What, what, typically, what sort of commission? Or, or what, uh, you know? Well, eventually, uh, I worked for Deke on a salary. Plus, if, if uh, say, for example, if I had laundered money in Australia and the client had $200,000, the, the thing is, keep it with us. We had Swiss banks. So I had a, not a big salary, but then if the client kept the money with me, I would receive a commission of 1%, which was very, very nice. If they renewed it next year, they would receive another 1% commission. So Deke was very, very uh, uh, good in terms of if you brought in business, you'd be well rewarded. Uh, but when I started my own company, because I eventually I could see the handwriting on the wall, and I couldn't keep a suitcase in my office every day, because I was always constantly on the plane, more than pilots probably, I, I decided to form my own company with Mr. Deke, and uh, they would quote me a preferential rate, and uh, I would do the business on my own. Uh, so then I would uh, say, quote, uh, if I quoted uh, 5% in Australia, Deke would charge me 3 and I would make the 2% overwrite. Uh, I did well, and, uh, but I paid a price later on. When I, you, know, you have to know when to hold them and know when to fold them, as they say. I, and I, I saw the handwriting on the wall, but I didn't fold them quickly enough. So <laughs> that's why I don't, I don't have any hard feelings for the government of the United States. I know they were... Uh, after they were after money, they were after uh, knowledge of money laundering and all, and trying to do their job. Uh, to this day, it was just an experience in life. But you know, sometimes things happen in life that are not good, but they put you in another direction that you would have never gone to if that thing not good didn't happen. So, uh, my experience in, in, in my life is to go with the flow, uh, take the good and the bad. Maybe there's always a bright uh, silver lining on something else that might happen to you. Uh, so in my, in my life, uh, I find myself uh, uh, at my age, I'm not, uh, I don't have a big bank account, but I have, uh, I think, a lot of blessings. I have a great family stood behind me. I have a lot of great friends and, uh, yeah, and I have good health. So what more could you want? <laughs> and a lot of friends. Thank you. Um, Ed Chin, journalist member here. Hi. Just wonder... Um, how much time do you spend in Hong Kong? And also, can you tell us a little bit more about the Hour of Love? Is okay, it a thank Section you. 88 company? Uh, it's on 1044 Metro Plus. I've been in Hong Kong uh, residence for 45 years. Married a Chinese girl. My wife still 45 years later, even though I put her through hell. <laughs> and I have two uh, great sons and two granddaughters, which I'm blessed with. The Hour of Love, uh, it became a vocation because... Uh, uh, I was going to, reluctantly going to the church. Even though I have Irish background, I never really walked in one in my life. A lot of these things are in the book. I think there's a lot of stories, a lot of funny things, too, that you'll enjoy if you happen to uh, read the book. Uh, but the Hour of Love, then, uh, I started playing music uh, because I knew Filipino domestic helpers on Sunday night love music. They're very musical people. So I started playing 13 songs, and pretty soon the program was very, very popular. And... Uh, but the phone started ringing one day, and I said, "It must be a, a, a prayer. Re it must be a, a request for a song because I was afraid to speak in the microphone. I just play music, and that's about it." And uh, so the caller said, "Oh, Brother Bruce, I became Brother Bruce all of a sudden. Brother, uh, would you please pray for my daughter? She's taking the nursing board exam tomorrow." I said, "Oh, sure. I'm not a pastor. I'm not a priest, but I can say, yeah, I'll pray for her. I ask all the listeners to pray for her." A couple of weeks later, she called back, "Hallelujah! My daughter passed the nursing board exam." <laughs> Woo, the phone lit up like a Christmas tree. 
because of course prayers are answered, good news happens. I started receiving prayer requests like, and then more prayer requests for good news came in. I guess the, not, the ones that answered, they didn't call. So the, prog <laughs> the program <laughs> developed a tremendous following. Then one day a Filipino priest said, oh, Bruce, um, I was visiting the prison. You know, the prisoners are listening to your program. I said, wow, here's my GPO box number. And I have received a flood of letters. Now I have my, pres my, my segment from 832 to uh, 10. It's called Prison Visitation on the Air, which I normally receive about... Uh, 25 letters from all the inmates. I try to visit them if I can. I receive recordings, MP3 recordings from their children all over the world to supplement the fact that they're, they can hardly call home at all. I play these, of course, everybody can hear them. I play all their favorite music in about 10 different languages. And uh, this has sort of become my vocation. As my wife says, at least that keeps me out of trouble on Sunday night. <laughs> so it's been a great experience. I keep it going now. This Sunday program, if you'd like to tune in, it's number 730. That's 730 Sunday nights. So I feel like it's a, I'm on a treadmill. I don't know how to get off of it. It's like running a marathon doesn't end. But uh, I'll keep it going as long as uh, I can. Wonderful. Yes. Hello. One more question. Bruce, sure. uh, I'm Cheng, a former journalist. Uh -huh. uh, we all know that Hong Kong is a great center for uh, uh, money laundry for Chinese uh, uh, rich people. Mm. Do you think the Hong Kong government is doing enough to wipe this out? Or if the Hong Kong government is in fact condoning this kind of activities uh, in order to keep Right. Hong Kong status as a financial center. Right. I think it's a good combination of both. It's really a good question. I think they're playing lip service to all the uh, rules that are being really forced on them by, I think, international regulations and primarily the USA. Uh, and Hong Kong wants to maintain its uh, viability as an international center. But uh, I really think things can get carried away and a little bit too far. I think what made Hong Kong really great is laissez-faire, free enterprise, uh, no questions asked in a, in a way for the majority of the people because uh, most people are not uh, uh, money launderers, you know, even with cash. I mean, you can't look at 92,000 reports and say these people are money launderers. They're ordinary people. Maybe they are in cash for different reasons. Privacy it could be. Uh, but I think the Hong Kong government is, is walking a, a difficult line. I think they're doing the best they, they can. Personally, I, I, I'm naturally... I think uh, I have an aberration against regulations, uh, things like that. Maybe I just don't have a legal mind to understand all the ramifications. Uh, but uh, I think the more regulations come on, the more it becomes a drag on the economy, on the banking system. And uh, I may be accused as a person then there for, sort of for favoring people who launder money. But no, that, that's not the case. I think still ingrained in me is the deep philosophy of we're not policemen. I don't think the banks should be doing uh, that, I think, should be looking after their customers. If, if a person wants to open up a bank account, I think the bank should roll out the red carpet. I mean, why are they there? They want to open up accounts. But look at how difficult it is. I mean, I, I, if anybody here knows right now how difficult it is to open an account in Hong Kong, that can't be good for Hong Kong. So I don't have all, all the answers, uh, except I, I, I worry about excesses. Yeah. Shall we squeeze in one more last question? Question? No? Well, yes, okay. Okay, <laughs> thank, thank you. you. Bruce, uh, uh, your book is uh, cash only, I guess. Uh, I <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, yes. <laughs> if anybody has a suitcase of cash, too, I might have a look at it. Sorry, my <laughs> I'm name only is, uh, joking. <laughs> my name yes, is Ralph Lieberman. I just wondered, you said, uh, I guess you didn't fold in time. In your um, profession... Yes. Do you know of anybody that has folded in time, or has uh, it always no, ended without a jail, in, or was? In my case, it's like a carious when you fly clues too close to the flame, you know, make them uh, tumbling down in a ball of fire. That happens to me, and uh, I didn't. I was very closed in my business. For example, I, uh, when I was laundering money, I didn't know anybody who was actually doing the same thing. And if I did, I would avoid them. I think like the plague. Uh, because one, I had a partner once, though, his name was Tom O'Donnell, a bright young guy who joined me. Uh, like any marriage, it turn, sometimes it turns into divorce. He, he went off and started his own company. I was very uh, disappointed at that time. He was a very good commodity trader. But he met a, a client from, Thai, uh, from Thailand, and uh, his name is Jack Corman. I think I can mention it. He's probably still there. And he was actually a DEA uh, snitch. And my friend Tom... 
uh, was actually in, indicted in a big money laundering case in Washington, D.C. So I had avoided that, actually. And I, and I, I just think I, I walked through the minefields, and I was very lucky I didn't stumble on only one. Well, this was a fascinating uh, talk. Thank, Thank you very you. much, Bruce. I will never look at golf bags the same way, <laughs> both, I guess. Uh, That's and, true. Um, yeah, Thank please you. join me in thanking Thank uh, Bruce. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Thank you. One little tidbit on the, on the golf clubs, though. They looked a little bit strange going through customs with no shoes and only two or three clubs, but it was never questioned for the weight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.